I don't choose the vast majority of people that I spend a great deal of time relationship building with. As a deputy public defender, I'm assigned a heavy caseload of individuals with the responsibility to advocate for them. These are people who have been accused of acts for which we of a society often find are unworthy of love or respect. But zealous advocacy requires truly connecting with somebody. You cannot advocate for someone you don't care about. I don't fall in love with my clients, but I do work towards building a relationship of respect and trust with each and every one. I've spent a lot of time thinking about this topic because when I tell people my occupation, the most common response is, how can you represent those people? Or, what do you do when you know they're guilty? How do you sleep at night? Those sorts of questions. And there's a number of honest answers. I'm defending the Constitution. I'm defending the rights that we all have. Should we be arrested? Should we be charged with a crime? Also, most cases resolve in plea bargains. My job is to make sure that my clients are treated fairly by the system, that as a poor person, they walk out the door with the same punishment and the same consequences that a wealthy person does. But perhaps the most honest answer is one that's a little less easy to digest in a cocktail party conversation. And that answer is that I'm proud to be a voice for the voiceless. The poor people that I represent are the most marginalized in our society, and most of them have never had someone advocate on their behalf ever in their lives. So because of these life experiences, they're coming into this with an incredible amount of distrust for our justice system. And here I am, provided free by that justice system, seen as an extension. So I'm often starting at a place where I too am viewed from a place of distrust. I don't have an average or a typical client. They come to me from all walks of life, all various backgrounds. I represent people who have had no experience whatsoever with the criminal justice system and plenty of people for whom this ain't their first rodeo, as the saying goes. <laughs> I've represented clients who, in other contexts, I could see developing lifelong friendships with. I've represented clients who've tried the very edges of my patience. One of the most important functions of my job is the humanization of my clients. To the judge and to the district attorney, my clients are the act they committed. If in that negotiation process I limited myself to the walls of the police report, I would be doing my client a great disservice. Humanizing them to the other actors in the process is what gets them that plea deal, gets them that fair treatment in the system, and I can't do that work unless I know who they are as a person. So this is really where those relationship building skills come in. So I recently represented a young man named Jorge, and we took his case all the way through jury trial. He was charged with a home invasion robbery and being a gang member. He was 20. This is already his second serious adult offense after a, a juvenile record that was quite long as well. He grew up in a poor Latino neighborhood in central Contra Costa County where joining the gang was about survival. By the time I got to him, his body was already covered with the tattoos, that, that manifestation, that lifelong commitment to the gang life. Needless to say, this was a man with some serious walls up. Over the course of the nine months that we worked together, I visited Jorge at the jail on a regular basis, attempting to crack his world. And the work that it took to get to know and respect him was a lot. So the first of the, the themes or the teachings that came up in my work with Jorge was time. And this is obvious, but relationship building requires time. It requires putting in the work. Some of my clients I work with for years, and some for just a few weeks. But what it means for me, what time means for me, is getting to the jail, putting in the FaceTime, returning the phone calls, 
figuring out how to split my time between 30 or 40 serious felony cases and giving everyone the value of me in their lives. The next theme was language. Building relationships is all about communication. When I'm constantly meeting new clients from very extremely different backgrounds from my own, adapting to their language is so important. Picking up their speech in a way that respects how they communicate, allowing them to speak their true voice without mimicking them or talking down to them. Sometimes it's as easy as in a first conversation dropping a few F-bombs so that they know, talk how you talk. We're not going to have open communication unless you're free to be who you are. And then finally with Jorge, adaptation. For the first several months working with Jorge, I didn't even know he had a fiance. Eventually it came out when she gave me a call. And when he wasn't willing to share his difficult childhood, the troubled history that led him to the gangs and to the streets where he was, I got that history from her and took it back to him and bridged that gap and said, I know you've had these experiences. Let's talk about them. So the second case study is Jennifer. Jennifer was a meth addict and a habitual car thief. When I first encountered her, she was eight months pregnant in jail. I was able to get her out of custody. I worked incredibly hard communicating between the court, between her, and between a residential drug treatment facility that accepted new mothers and young babies. And I got her out of jail and into that program, or at least with a promise to get into that program. But what then followed was several months of excuses and deception from my client, stalling and frustration on my part. She skirted by continually avoiding responsibility and demanding my assistance in helping her do so. So ultimately, and not surprisingly, she ended up back in jail, and I moved on to the next case. Some learnings that I took out of my experience with Jennifer were role awareness. So one of the difficult parts of my work is the separation of advocate, advocacy, and paternalism. My role is to speak for the client, to demand what they want. But especially with my mentally ill clients, my drug addicted clients, it can be very difficult to appear time and time in court again asking for what they want when I have a feeling that what they need is something different. So having that clear separation definition in my mind before entering each new relationship, I can separate that and say, this is my role is to speak for you. You have other parents. You have other social workers. But it's difficult. And the other learning from Jennifer was self-protection. Because I felt burned by this experience. It was early on in my felony career. And the client never got past her distrust of me as part of the system. I never got past my paternalistic attitude to try to help her change. We never got to a point of true trust-based advocacy. So instead, I took it as a learning experience about pulling back and not winning them all. Jennifer, of course, was not my only learning experience client, but she's a good illustration of the need to protect my emotional well-being, my reputation in the legal system, and frankly, my license to practice law when I recognize that I'm being dragged along for the con. So my final case study is Hank. And Hank uh, is a child molester who I represented. He was in his 50s and had multiple victims. And he's now serving over 20 years in prison. What he did was heinous. What he did was rightly deplorable by our societal standards but in no way was he any less deserving of my trust and my relationship building than any other client. This may be the hardest for people to accept, but I found the respect for this man necessary to truly advocate for him. I spent the time getting to know who he was, his interests, his family history, and frankly, a lot of our talks were, what's the rest of your life gonna be like in prison? 
And I can tell you that Hank is the only person who's ever written me a letter from prison that was purely a thank you letter. There was no, what's the status of my appeal? There was no request for anything. It was thank you for treating me like a human. So the teaching from this is not forgiveness. It was not my place to judge or to forgive Hank. The teaching here in my practice, in my relationship building, was compartmentalization. If every time I was at the jail talking to this man, I was thinking about the acts he committed, I could never have gotten to that place of respect and advocacy. Instead, I separated out what he had done from the person he was. And through that, was able to find the humanity in him, in this sick, sad person, and to take that to the district attorney, and to get him a plea deal that avoided the humiliation and degradation of a public trial, avoided for the victims of him the trauma of testifying in trial. So I'm sure that the people that I spend most of my time relationship building with are very different than those who you may choose to build your relationships with. But we're using many of the same skills, struggling through many of the same pitfalls. So to answer that age-old question, how can you represent those people? Well, it's easy because they're people. Thank you.